Well, so first off, um, thanks to Eric Gilliland for um, volunteering to be the uh, the chairperson for this session. Um, and we are going to be talking about how to contribute to MetPlus during this particular session. Um, so all the presentations are from MetPlus team members, and we're starting with Julie Kristopnik. Take it away, Julie. Thank you. So for those of who, you who don't know me, my name is Julie Prostopnik and I'm a software engineer on MetPlus. And as Tara mentioned, I'm going to talk today about how to contribute. So first I want to mention that we do encourage contributions um, to MetPlus from the community. And we're going to talk today about some of the ways in which you can do that. The first, which I'll be going over, is creating discussions, which is our method of user support and also just interaction with the community on various topics. Then we'll be talking about adding new MetPlus use cases, contributing to C++ code, MetPlus analysis scripts, pull requests, and then we'll show some existing, or we'll provide some existing examples of external contributions. Okay, so as I mentioned, I'm gonna be talking about user support, which is the MetPlus GitHub discussion forum. And um, so I've got the link here for you and I've also listed it out. And basically this is a collaborative communication forum where the MetPlus community can ask and answer questions, gather feedback, and share tips and tricks. Currently, the discussions are categorized to help community members find related discussions and begin conversations in the right place. So our current categories that we have are announcements, configuration, existing builds, file IO, incoming, installation, plot generation, statistical computation, tips and tricks, and use cases. And we are limited to 10 categories, so that's what we found that works so far. Um, we do ask that you post new discussions in the relevant category, although sometimes it can be a little tricky to figure out where it should go. So if you're unsure, just post in the incoming category and then someone on the MetPlus team will move it to the correct category. So as I mentioned, um, we've got various categories and there are basically two types of categories. We have a tips and tricks category, which is for open-ended discussion. So it enables the community to have conversations that don't require a definitive answer to a question. And then all of the other categories I mentioned, except announcements, uh, which is also open-ended discussion, is a, a question and answer uh, category. And that enables the community to ask questions, suggest answers, and even vote on the best suggested answer. And so um, we have two main discussion announcements on our page, and I'll, sh I'll go over those in just a minute. Um, but we have uh, the first one, which is welcome to MetPlus component discussions. And that has an overview of what discussions is for. It gives some resources for getting help for MetPlus. And it also uh, provides tips for posting questions. And then the, the second one we have is how to send us data. And I will go ahead and show those to you now. So in the Met plus components discussion. Um, some things we have in terms of resources are um, the ability to search and post new discussions here. So you could search for the topic you're interested in and uh, hopefully find a solution. Uh, previously, we also had um, Met help and that was our email account that you would write to. And so there is an email archive and you can also search those. There's years and years of history there. So it's still a good resource. And you could also search online and Google or whatever search engine you'd like for met underscore help followed by the topic. And again, that would help to search that email archive. And then we also have our user's guides available and there's a link to the downloads page where you can find links to the user's guides. And then the tips for posting questions, you know, we just wanna ensure that you um, provide us with um, all the information that would be helpful for us to have less of a back and forth. So if there's an error message, it would be really helpful if you provide that, or if there are log files, it would be helpful if you could attach those. Uh, sometimes GitHub only, ex um, GitHub only accepts certain formats for attachments. So if you have any problems attaching it to the discussion, you can look at that other announcement on the discussions page, which is how to send us data. And then that will um, show you how to upload it to our FTP site. And we just ask that once you've uploaded it there that you let us know so that we know that we have something waiting for us. Okay, so going back to, oops, presentation. Okay, so basically an overview of the process that we go through, a new discussions are posted and we have five staff members that take turns monitoring discussions each day of the week. And again, we welcome users in the community to, to answer the questions. Um, and, and in fact, to encourage that, we actually leave the discussion unanswered until the next day to allow the user community to respond. 
But when we do look at it and it is time to respond the following day, we first check the tips and tricks category and we look for new posts that may actually be questions and we'll move those if necessary. And we'll also add labels and I'll show you those in a moment as well. And then for the other categories, basically what we do is we check for any new unanswered discussions. And then we check the category that the discussion is in and we add labels if necessary. The labels allow it, uh, hopefully make it easier for folks to find what they're looking for. And I'll, I'll show you that in just a minute as well. Uh, so let's go back to the discussion forum. You can see these blue items here are the current labels for the current discussions. And you can see there are some marked as unanswered and some marked as answered. So what we do is we go over to filter and we search for unanswered questions. And then we go and we follow up on those. We see what came in and what hasn't been answered yet and give a necessary follow up. Um, this one it was has this label on it here. You, you can search for labeled. You can see this is, is unanswered. But we could also add a label. Maybe we were curious about the build pro process. We're having problems installing. So we want to go ahead and click on that. Um, there are no unanswered questions marked with build process. But if I change that to is answered, we can find them. So here we can see all the topics that were related to build process. So that allows for easy answering. But again, when we're taking a look, we search for unanswered. Let me take off that label. And we, we answer them in that nature. OK, so going back to the presentation. Um, in order to have a resolution for the discussion, there's really no way to close a discussion. So if you find that we've satisfactorily answered your question, we'd like you to click the mark as answer button. For any unanswered discussion, each comment will have a, a mark as answer button that you can click. So if you find that we've answered it, please go ahead and mark that as answered. And then we will um, lock the conversation. And the reason we lock the conversation first of all is because um, that discussion may go unnoticed since the discussion's been answered. As I said, our process is to go through and search for unanswered discussions. So if it's already been marked answered, um, we don't want anyone adding additional comments there because it could be overlooked if it needs attention. So we want to lock that. And it also encourages new or it encourages users to ask new questions in a new discussion rather than posting the old ones and having numerous questions perhaps of a different nature in that same chain. It also makes the question and answers easier for other users to follow if they're just contained to the, the one topic at hand. So that is the overview of how we uh, respond to discussions. Uh, do you have any questions about that? And that was a little quicker than I expected. When I did it on my own, I ran over time. And so, uh, yeah, I apologize if that went too quickly. Um, oh, thanks. That makes the job easy. Um, sure. I can only see so many people up here at a, a time. Um, so let, let me just check the chat. Doesn't look like. Ah, oh, here from Gordon Brooks. It says, "Can you show your second slide again?" You bet. Um, I'm not sure if you mean the second slide from the overview or the second slide from the support. Um, if it would be helpful, if you're looking for this, I can post that in the chat. That one, or, Julie. I was looking for the, the link again. The link. Okay, yeah. Let me go ahead and put that in the chat, too, for users. Okay. And it looks like John has his hand raised. Hey, Julie. Um, do we still receive any questions uh, at methelp at ucardi.edu? And if so, what do we do with them? Great question. So we do sometimes receive uh, questions uh, at MedHelp, and we do have an auto reply set up to re automatically respond to indicate that we've moved to discussions. But we also often provide a personal response in case people are ignoring those auto replies, as we sometimes do, uh, just to let you know that we've moved to discussions. We'll ask you to, uh, we'll send you the link to post to a new discussion, and then we'll go ahead and close that ticket. So if we do get those on occasion, we will uh, move them over to discussions or ask the user to move them over to discussions. Any other questions? Yeah, so I think if there are no other questions, it, it is time for the next one to go. Um, so John Opitz, are you, John, are you, are you on? Hello, John. 
Hey, oh, zero. sorry about that, Eric. <laughs> no I was just in the middle of getting the screen all set up, and I was like, "Oh man, I got to move fast." <laughs> um, I just wanted to make sure you were there. So uh, yeah, yeah. No so worries. John's going to talk about adding uh, use cases. Uh, can, Eric, can you confirm that you can see just my slides? I uh, yes, I think that's just your slides. Okay, perfect. Um, um, thank you. So, hi everybody. This is John O'Pats um, presenting on behalf of the MetPlus team. I'm going to be going for adding new MetPlus use cases. Um, so, uh, as we go in, so you want to add a use case. First of all, congratulations. That's great news. We love the support. Um, you've never picked a better time, and I'll go over why that is in like another slide. Um, but oftentimes, you have to ask yourself, but why? Um, Sometimes it's because you have a new data set that you want to show off, and that's great. Um, there's tools inside, again, we'll cover that in another slide, um, that lets you know what data sets are already covered, and maybe you want to show something off to the community. Um, there might be uh, an opportunity to showcase a lesser used tool. Um, there are some tools that we have, like GridStat and PointStat and Series Analysis, that get a lot of coverage. Um, but like Mode Time Domain is not necessarily touched as much, or Mode itself. Um, so it might be kind of nice to add a use case um, using that tool. Or there might be a need in your part of the scientific community where um, you're starting to integrate into Met Plus and there's just not a good coverage or someone keeps asking you, hey, how do you do that use case? How are you doing that verification? Um, and you want to make it available not just to your part um, or your department, but maybe to the scientific community at large. Um, so really the first question after you've kind of answered why am I doing this, is where do you start? And like I said, there's no better time to start than there is now um, because we have a very step-by-step -step guide in the user's guide um, that'll walk you through it. In this case, you're gonna go to the contributor's guide. So on the left side of the screen, you can see um, that the contributor's guide is outlined in red. And then um, specifically in the center of the screen, you can see an additional red box that outlines section eight called adding use cases. That section along with section six, the GitHub workflow, are going to be the most useful sections that you have. Um, so at the bottom of the screen, you can see there is a URL. Um, it's to the contributor's guide directly. Um, if you want to take a screenshot of that, otherwise I can drop that in after the chat here. Um, and you'll have access to that. But that's ultimately what's going to help you walk through this and not feel so lost. Um, the first thing you really need to cover is that GitHub workflow. Um, it's very important to have a grasp of this because if you don't, it's going to, yeah, it's going to provide, present a lot of obstacles. Um, the important part that covers all of this is you're going to need a GitHub account. Um, so if you don't have one, it's free to sign up. Um, you probably want to use something that incorporates um, some aspect of your name or organization that you're working with so that when you request access on our side or you're working with us, it's a little easier for us to identify who you are. Um, again, this is all covered in section six of the contributor's guide, the GitHub workflow, and 6.2.1 is a particular interest because that list that I got a screenshot of helps you walk through exactly what you're gonna be doing. Um, from creating the GitHub issue to track the new contribution all the way to cleaning up after the pull request. And I'll briefly go over all these things here, but um, the contributor's guide goes into much better detail and actually tells you exactly what kind of commands you're gonna be putting in. It's just not really feasible to do it in another six minutes here. Um, so you need to, when you start setting up your use case, it's really good to try to find um, where it's going to fit in um, for a category. We have several categories that already have representation. I've outlined the ones in yellow that um, currently are in our contributors guide as uh, use case categories, but just aren't represented. So that includes extremes, miscellaneous, and planetary boundary layer. But all the other ones that are listed there, we do have examples of. It doesn't mean that we don't need your use case. It just means now it has a home. Um, if you feel at any time like these use cases or these categories do not fit exactly what you're looking for, we encourage you to write to the discussions that Julie just discussed um, and ask if maybe we should start a new use case category. That's always a possibility. Um, additionally, um, it's it's also good to have um, follow some of the standards that we have. So we have a naming scheme set up for use cases, uh, the Met tool followed by forecast, OBS, Climo, and descriptor, with Met tool being the predominant 
um, analysis tool being used, so like GridStat or series analysis. Um, forecast and OBS and Climo describing where um, these file sources are from, um, if you're using GEFs or if you're using the MRMS. Um, and then a descriptor um, that just helps people identify very quickly what your use case is trying to do. Not exactly sprawling sentences, um, but just things that you think help create a very unique use case. Um, additionally, section 8.4.2 has additional rules such as uh, no variables for specific path or environments, trying to limit the overall runtime, you shouldn't have errors, et cetera, et cetera. Again, check out that section. It'll have the list of uh, rules that they can follow. It's by no means restrictive. It's just trying to help everybody else run your use case when eventually it gets accepted into the, the community code. Um, probably the most important aspect that I wanted to cover is this slide, and it's the documentation aspect. Um, you're going to have to create a Python Sphinx documentation file, which is covered in section 8.4.4 of the Contributor's Guide. Um, you don't have to start fresh. Um, definitely copy from existing documentation. You don't need to reinvent the wheel. The wheel is already there for your taking. But make sure that you fill in all the sections relevant to your use case. It's very easy, especially when you're looking at all the things you need to fill out. And you might just be excited to get your use case working inside of MedPlus, that if no one can use it, it's not useful to anyone, except to maybe you. Um, so do your best to fill in the documentation, include a photo, um, and then you'll have to review the documentation online or build it manually. And again, there's steps in the contributor's guide that'll cover this, uh, but ultimately you can use a URL just like this one now that we use read the docs that will literally populate it as long as that branch has been pushed in um, to the latest version. Um, also, don't forget to update the verification data sets guide as a, for novel data sets. If that's the reason why you're creating this use case, definitely make sure that is on your list. Um, and spend just a little bit of time making sure that your documentation is clean. Um, so as you're going along, you'll have to package up your, your data sets. It's not expected that users will go out and find these data sets. They should be provided to them. But ultimately, we want to do the bare minimum. We don't expect users to download 10 gigs or 20 gigs of data um, just to run one use case. So if you have a NetCDF or a um, prep buffer file, um, find ways to slim it down to just the variables that you're interested in showcasing um, and make it as small as possible. Uh, copy over the pre-made environment file from the DTC web server. Again, there's commands for that inside the contributor's guide. Make sure that you watch your version number and spelling. And there's um, a screenshot of it to the lower right of the variables that you'll have to change, like the use case category and the use case name. Make sure that those line up with what you've already done. Otherwise, it'll cause headaches down the way. Um, and then again, 8.5.1.7 to 1.9 show you how to tar up the data, and then make sure you move it over to the Mohawk. Or if you don't have access to that, FTP it. And there's instructions on that on the uh, discussions page, which again, Julie has already discussed. And finally, the most possibly you know, the second most important part of once you've made it all documented, made it all beautiful, you got to put together a pull request. Um, Section 8.6 covers that really well in terms of what kind of goes into that. And 6.2.1.9 specifically goes into what a pull request looks like from outside the core team. When you're filling in the template on GitHub, make sure that you're very specific. You show off things like testing done, what the due date is, um, so that the person who does the testing knows what's expected of them. And if you feel like you've been doing all the work, don't worry. The uh, pull request reviewer, the PR reviewer, has a lot of steps to do too. They have to confirm that it runs. They have to review the runtime. They have to look at the developed data directory. So ultimately, this comes down to teamwork. Make sure that you're talking with our team. Make sure that you're keeping apprised of everything so that nothing's lost in the cracks. Um, after everything's approved, um, you'll, we'll merge the use case branch into the develop branch. We're going to clear up the web server. We're going to get a pull request for the develop into the develop ref so everything runs. Um, once that's all done, you've been told that you know your use case is in the develop branch. You'll definitely want to review it at that point to make sure that there's no mistakes. And if there are, fix it in beta, um, promote it, and then celebrate because you did it. You got a use case in. It's awesome. So, um, one, so one minute, John. Yep, no problem. This is the last slide. Um, we and obviously. 
this is not a very uh, simplistic thing. It's not a two-step process. It's multiple steps. So you might have skipped the part where you got stuck. So use the force of multiple sources of help. Um, there is user's guides um, on MET+, Plus, on all the tools, on MET and all the tools. There's the GitHub discussions, which is already covered, and other use cases. I mean, these are people who have tread the same path that you're trying to tread. So don't try to reinvent the wheel. Don't get your wheels stuck in the mud. Reach out when you need help. That's what we're here for. Um, and at that point, I think we got like 20 seconds for questions. <laughs> yeah, if there's uh, brief questions, otherwise um, maybe you can do them in the chat. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't see any new chat. Is there anyone with their hand up? I, I, I can only see about four or five. So, um, so if not, uh, thanks, John. And, and so, I apologize. I, I realized that I mispronounced your name. I, I was trying to go by memory, and and I said Opeats and not Opats. <laughs> That's all right. I've I've learned, trained myself to hear all versions of it. So as long yeah. as it starts with an O, I'll know it's me. <laughs> John O, I should have said. <laughs> so next up is John Howie Gotway, and he's going to be talking about contributing to C plus plus code. So when you're ready, John. All right, Eric. Can you let me see? Let me go into presentation mode. How does that look to you? Do you see my title slide there, Eric? Yeah. Okay. Good. Great. So I will. I have ten minutes. So Eric, keep me on 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 top or on on time here because I okay. may talk long. Um, so I'm talking about community contributions to the Met code itself. So Met is written primarily in C++. So that's why the title is contributing to C++ code. So I want to start with a discussion of software version control. Um, when we got started in 2008. The research applications lab, or actually at that time it was called the research applications program, um, placed all of its code into an internal CVS repository. Along the way, we eventually switched from CVS to Subversion, but that SVN repository still lived inside the NCAR firewall. So while we published to users gzipped and tar, fi gzipped tar files with the source code for each software release, the code repository itself was still not available. It was behind the firewall. But that all changed in 2019 when we migrated from SVN to Git and, and GitHub. Fortunately, we were able to transition our full SVN commit history. Um, so you'll actually see tags in the Met GitHub repository dating all the way back to 2009 for version uh, 2.0. Um, however, I wouldn't actually recommend checking that out, those very old versions, because I'm sure they won't compile anymore. Um, but it's, it's kind of cool to be able to look back and see all the commit history. So um, we initially moved Met over to the NCAR organization on GitHub, um, but soon learned that we couldn't add non-NCAR staff to the NCAR organization. Um, and the DTC is distributed with, with folks contributing from many different um, uh, organizations. So that motivated us to create the DT Center organization on GitHub, um, which is where all the Met Plus software repositories live, along with other DTC code repositories. Since working remotely during the pandemic, um, the Met Plus workflow that John Opatz mentioned um, has really matured a lot. And we use templates for GitHub issues, which we try to define the, the pieces of work that we're going to do as clearly as possible. And for pull requests review, um, we also use templates to clearly define what are the responsibilities of the person um, reviewing proposed code changes. And I'll, I'll come back to more details in a, in a couple of slides. Um, but yeah, through through the workflow, we have automated documentation via read the docs that John O also mentioned. Um, there's uh, automated builds via Docker Hub uh, that lists, well, Liz that if you mentioned the, the use of software containers. Um, and then we also do regression tests via GitHub Actions. Okay, so next slide here. So I would say prior to 2019, with our move to GitHub, um, direct code contributions were not very realistic. Um, and really, the contributions were more in the area of algorithms. So for example, um, I remember working closely with Barbara Kinsati on the intensity scale decomposition that, that made its way into the Wavelet stat tool, um, working with Beth Ebert and others on implementing fraction skill score and grid stat, working closely with Marion uh, Mittermeier not so long ago on implementing Hira uh, in point stat. Um, there was there were so also some DTC projects for incorporating observational uncertainty and ensemble stat 
and working with you, Eric, on distance maps as an addition to the grid stat tool and lots of other contributions. You know, the we're we're taking basically the 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 best ideas in the area of verification and and implementing making many of them available through the Met software, not creating them ourselves, but working with uh, external experts to, to implement them. And oftentimes with each um, with with each algorithm, um, we had some sample code with which to start, either an IDL or R or MATLAB or Fortran for the purposes of comparison and validation of the C++ code that we wrote up. But um, as Marion this morning mentioned in her uh, talk, um, we, we got a major contribution from the Met Office, specifically Matt Glover, uh, a, a Met Office employee um, in Met. So you, you might see this notation, Met number, pound sign 1926. It's basically Met issue number 1926 is a description of the, the task, which is enhancing grid stat to use OpenMP for the computation of neighborhood methods. And then he, so he worked in a uh, feature branch of uh, Met for that issue. And he submitted his changes via a pull request, which is met pound sign 1977. Um, so because you know we had a working relationship with the Met Office, um, we actually added MAF to the DT Center organization, and he was able to work right directly within the the GitHub, you know, within GitHub and and work on a feature branch. Um, there, in addition, there were a couple of smaller changes to scripts that were that were proposed via forks. Um, but those those contributions were were pretty few and far between. So um, big picture, we you know I mentioned we have issues. So here's an example of an issue that's being worked on right now. Um, we want to update the grid the MRMS table in uh, Met in the Met uh, code, uh, the Grib two table to to make it uh, bring it up to speed with what the current usage is. So in this issue, um, you'll notice in the top right corner there's two people who are assigned to it. We usually, whenever we're working on an issue, we assign it. We, we like to assign it to both an engineer and a scientist. So we um, we we define who the engineer who who the engineer should ask questions to. Um, we we apply several different types of labels to to organize the the work. So the component, basically, what piece of the software are we touching? Um, what the priority level is? What group or groups requested this work? And what is the type of work? Is this an enhancement? Is it a bug fix? That sort of thing. This particular issue is being worked on the was being was was is being worked on the Met 11.00 Beta 2 development cycle. So for each release, we organize our work into into projects that are the Beta 1, Beta 2, Beta 3 releases, basically. And so that's that's where we're doing working on this task, and it's ultimately slated to go into the Met 11.00 milestone. So about um, four more minutes, John. How many? Five. Five. Okay. Thanks, Eric. Um, so I would say, you know, if there is a piece of work that you would like to, to which you with that you would like to do to contribute, I would say um, start with discussions and propose a new idea and have a discussion about it, and um, work with the Met Plus team to transition that discussion into a new issue. Because if you just submit an issue without any labels and without a, a milestone assigned, without a project, we're we're uh, likely to lose track of it. So you know, I think coordinating with the team to define issues and in particular the metadata for those issues um, is, is a great idea. Um, so whenever, you know, if, if you are in, in added to the, to the DT Center organization and can work in a feature branch, that's an internal developer, as an internal developer, then you, you can submit a pull request via a feature branch. Alternatively, if you're outside of the organization, you can submit a pull request via a fork. Um, basically, the pull request is is a request to submit the chain um, your your proposed code changes into the develop branch, so into the into our into our branch that we're using to prepare for the next release. And one thing that we've done to uh, over the last year to really facilitate the possibility of contributions is set up GitHub Actions, uh, which I abbreviate as GHA, to, to run a regression test to make sure, to see if any of the, the test output has changed. So here I'm showing two different pull requests, one with a red X next to it, and one with a green check mark next to it. The red X means one of the, at least one of the automated GitHub Actions tests has failed. And um, 
requires you know further explanation. The green check means that all the tests have run, all the out, none of the none of the output has changed, and so there's there's no differences to further investigate. And I'm not gonna I'm not gonna discuss this in any more detail. I see that George is gonna discuss um, more details about the pull request process, other than to just point out that this little wire diagram illustrates um, or is a summary of all the tests that are that are run in our testing workflow for MET. And that that uh, that link internal test unit dot slash XML, that's where the, the tests that are run for the MET software are defined. So um, in this little image in the bottom right, we see a, a pull request. And one thing in particular I want to point out is in the bottom right corner, small words, you can see the word development. And what that is, is a link uh, for this pull request back to the original issue that defined the work to be done. So um, if there are differences, okay, um, if, yeah, if there are differences in the results, in the test results, were the changes expected? Did they, perhaps they, perhaps they are expected because we fixed a bug in the existing output and we corrected the result. Or maybe we've added a new test that generated a new output. Those are valid reasons for changing the output. Or were they unexpected? And we, the result of unintended consequences. You change one piece of the library code and didn't realize it would cha change the results from some other application code. Um, so, so I found personally these, um, the, the automated tests via GitHub Actions to be incredibly useful. So one minute, John. Thanks. Okay, so um, recent changes I want to mention. The develop branch uh, for MET version 11.0 that we're actively working on, we have modified its structure considerably. Um, and so that um, the repository structure now equals the same structure, uh, directory structure that you get if you want Tara MET release. And the reason why we did that is um, with the move to GitHub, People, you know, developers increasingly just clone the repository and want it to be this, uh, want to be able to just compile it in place without actually having to use a release tar file at all. So that was the motivation for changing the structure. Um, so because of that, now for for 11 point for the development versions for 11.0, we're able to use the GitHub provided releases instead of creating and uploading separate ones. Um, I want to point out that there is a Met contributors guide. It exists, but it is empty. So um, I, we have an issue that it currently exists to define an outline for those, uh, for the contributors guide, listing conventions, uh, code conventions, for example. So this is definitely a work in progress and, um, and we, we need to do a better job to define the process of, of receiving contributions from the community. Um, again, I'll just refer you back to MET Plus discussions and encourage you, if you have an idea for, for work and you'd actually like to, to do the, C, the, the code changes yourself, please coordinate with the MET Plus team via GitHub discussions. And that's my last slide. Any questions? Thanks, John. Um, there is one in the chat and it asks if all of the GitHub infrastructure used by, Met, by the MET Plus team is the same for a regular user or if there are more features used by the team that are available through a pro account? We are not paying for a, um, we are not paying for our use of GitHub at all. Um, we're not using enhanced features. Um, we do have, I guess in addition, something I haven't mentioned, we do use Slack for internal communication uh, across the Met Plus team. Um, and again, we're not paying for this a Slack, uh, you know, a special Slack account. We're just using the free version. If you would like to, um, you know, communicate with us through Slack, through Slack, we're we're happy to add you. Other questions? Okay, thanks. Thanks, John. Min, are you ready? Yes, I am. Okay, so okay Mena, let's when... see if I can get this correct this time. This, in spite of practicing, I still. Uh, yeah. Um... yeah. So, so Minna, when Gold, Gildemeister is going to talk about um, Met Plus analysis scripts. And I have the shortest slide deck of all. So I win. And it's because I'm building up on um, other people's. Oops. Uh, this is a this is building up from other people's uh, pre the previous my predecessors' slides. So I'm going to talk about 
the MET Plus analysis tools, how to contribute to those, uh, specifically the MetCalcPy and MetPlotPy side, because we've had this unique, uh, we were in the unique position where we've had quite a bit of contribution on for both the MetCalcPy repository and the MetPlotPy repository, especially from external um, entities. So I have a flow chart and the first thing you do um, is you create an issue in the appropriate GitHub repo, either the CalcPy or the PlotPy. I'm just MetCalcPy or MetPlotPy repository. And so the question we, you, we ask first is, do you have existing code? And uh, all of the contributions we received come from existing code. So I'm going to focus on the right-hand side of the flow chart. So what we do is, uh, so far, we've been receiving the code and putting it into either the MetPlotPy contributed directory or the MetCalcPy contributed directory uh, in, uh, in the appropriate GitHub feature branch. And then um, we help make any necessary changes. Usually there's a back and forth going on between the contributor and us. And then we, um, if, if, that, if things get stable, we can then either leave it in the CalcPy contributed directory or we'll move it to the appropriate um, CalcPy or PlotPy directory. Um, then what we normally do is we like to have tests and either unit tests or integrated tests and we use the PyTest framework to write tests. Um, if you have tests in unit test or some other like nose or other uh, PyTest framework, that's fine too. We can convert those. Uh, then we uh, also need some user documentation that we then place into read the docs. And then if you have additional Python, third-party Python packages that we don't currently ordinarily install when we're running our GitHub actions, we'll need to make any necessary updates to our GitHub actions so that things will pass. As John has previously mentioned in, the, um, in his talk, how we have the GitHub Actions running um, as part of our pull request uh, mechanism. Then what we, you or I, or, I, or us, whoever is responsible for incorporating the code, will uh, will submit a pull request. And the uh, it, sometimes it's just an engineer, sometimes it's an engineer and a scientist, will uh, or just a scientist will will review the code and make sure they can reproduce successfully what was supposed to be reproduced. And then when all of that passes, we then incorporate that code for the next release. Um, if you are starting from scratch, then we would go back up to the top. You would still create an issue in the appropriate GitHub repo, but now you're starting from scratch in the appropriate MetCalcPy, MetPlotPy uh, directory in your git given GitHub feature branch. And then we would follow with writing the PyTests and user documentation, GitHub Actions updates, submitting a pull request, um, and then incorporating the code in the next release. And so we've been fortunate. We've had ex uh, external contributions from NOAA, various branches of NOAA, um, University of Chicago, the Naval Research Lab. Um, I hope I'm not forgetting anybody. Uh, and, um, and of course, from within other entities of NCAR. And uh, so uh, we try to have documentation whenever possible. And uh, we, we definitely welcome, I want to reiterate what my uh, people who before me who gave talks have, have indicated, that we are very much open to receiving any any kind of suggestions or contributions from 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 you guys outside of of uh, the DTC. All right. With that, uh, do you have any questions? I don't see anything in the chat. And, and again, I can only see like five or six. So, so if anyone's raising, yeah, I. Hand. I can't see any. <laughs> That's what's nice about coming later. Everybody else has pretty much answered all the questions prior to you. Yeah. Okay. Well, if there are no more questions, then um, thanks, Minna. And we will move on to George McCabe, who will be ta telling us about pull requests. Yeah, thanks, Eric. Thanks, Minna. Okay, can everybody see my title page? Yes. Great. Okay, um, so I will talk, uh, continue our discussion about 
um, how to contribute and uh, focus on pull requests. Um, <clears throat> so the pull request process um, in, in a nutshell is the con contributors will create a branch from the develop branch. Um, if they don't have access to write to the actual DT center met plus repo, they would fork the repository and then create a branch from there. Um, and they would commit any changes they need into that branch. And then when the changes are ready, they will create a pull request through the GitHub web interface to merge the changes into the develop branch of the DT Center repo. Um, so here there's a picture of <clears throat> uh, what it looks like when you're about to create a pull request. And you can see the, um, repo the, sorry, the branch on the left, the base branch is the branch that will be merged into. And the branch on the right is the feature branch that will contain the new changes that you will merge into develop. Um, conflicts may need to be resolved. Um, this typically happens if the develop branch has changed since the branch was created. Um, so here it'll say you can't automatically merge and have a red X. Um, you can still create the pull requests, but you may need to do um, some conflict resolution to make sure that the changes um, can be merged into the develop branch. Um, so as John mentioned earlier, we use templates in our pull requests, um, and this is used to describe testing instructions. Um, so it's filled out by the author of the pull request and intended to be used by the reviewer of the pull request to make sure that everything is covered, make sure everything has been tested, make sure that um, all the, the appropriate information has been added. Um, so when you create a new pull request, it will automatically be populated with this information in this um, markup language. Um, and then when you create the pull request, it will format it nicely with these checkboxes. Um, so it's easy to read for the reviewer. Um, first of all, the author will describe any tests that they've performed already to make sure that these changes are acceptable. Uh, and then next, they will recommend any testing for the reviewer to perform. Uh, that includes information that they would need, um, where the input data would be located, and any other instructions that's needed to perform those tests. Um, this may be as simple as review the documentation that was added or, um, or review the code changes. Uh, it really depends on the type of contribution. Um, these next two items are um, more for the author to ensure that they've completed all of the steps that are needed for the contribution. Um, oftentimes we'll need to update the documentation with information about the new change. And so this is sort of a, a check for the author to make sure that they've made those documentation updates as part of their changes for the pull request. And if they've not done that, then they should go back and make those changes before creating the pull request. Um, similarly, for testing updates, they should, if any new tests that need to be added to test the new functionality, then that should also be done as part of this pull request. Um, this next item will the PR result chain uh, result in changes to the test suite. I'll get into that in the next slide. Um, then we also have a um, suggested review by date um, that so the uh, author can put in a date that and, and make sure that the reviewer completes it by that date. This is typically um, set if we have a, a beta release coming up and we really want to get that those changes incorporated and reviewed. Uh, before that that date. So moving on to the automated tests. So when a pull request is created, a suite of tests are triggered by GitHub Actions. Um, this is implemented in, in a few of the various MetPlus components. Um, and the tests automatically show up as checks once the pull request is created. So you can sort of see the results of these tests after they run in the pull request review um, web interface. Um, so back to this question, will the PR result in changes to the test suite? If this was marked as no in the template, then the reviewer should verify that all of the tests ran successfully. So they should be all successful, no fail. Um, if the PR result um, will result in changes, ch it will result in changes to the test suite. Um, this is marked yes, then there should be an explanation as to what tests are expected to fail and why. Um, so. Moving forward, this is a, a screenshot from a, an open pull request at the bottom of the interface. There'll be this little box that has all the checks. And here you can see it has 49 successful and one failing. And the little red X um, note, notes which one is failing. 
Uh, you can click on the details link there to get more information about that, or you can navigate to the actions tab of the repository web page, and that will have more information about the, the run and what actually failed. Um, so here is an example of a uh, from the GitHub Actions view of a testing suite that was triggered by a pull request, and you can see everything passed. And the no notably in the top left, there's a green check mark. Um, that means that everything passed, and you can also see the status says success. Um, the next example is a pull request that failed, and I, I I'm making air quotes. Uh, oh, my camera is on. Um, the, it, it failed, but that doesn't necessarily mean that something went wrong that's um, not acceptable. Um, so, so in this example, one of the use case test groups failed. And um, so the process for, um, for the reviewers to investigate, so they would click on the failed um, component and get some more information. So here's the, the job that failed, S2S13. Um, and this lists all of the different steps of the job, and it notes if it passed or failed. Um, so you can see just above the red X, there's a step that says run use cases. So this is the actual running of the uh, of Met Plus running the use case, and that has a, a check mark. So that means that everything went smoothly there. If that were to have a red X, that means that something went wrong and the use case failed and had a non-zero return code. Um, and something would need to be fixed before this pull request could be approved. Uh, but in this case, the use case runs fine, but um, the, f the failed step is the run difference tests step. And so scrolling down to the bottom of that has a summary of all the differences that were found. And in this case, uh, it lists a sort of a reason for the, for the difference and then a list of the path of the two files that were compared. And um, in this case, it says file not found, new output. And you can see in the A, which is the truth data set, um, there's no file that corresponds to the, data, the file in the B data set. And this is expected because we're adding a new use case, and the use case produces output that is not available in the truth data set that, that we use for these tests. Um, so if the, the reviewer looked at all these uh, differences and determined that they're all due to new output being generated from the new use case, then they can um, consider that as part of their approval process for the pull request, saying that um, there are no differences that were unexpected. We expect all those th these differences. Um, and then after this step, I'll, um, I think John O mentioned this briefly, um, of updating the develop ref branch. So there, we have a branch that is sort of the latest stable version of the code that generates these truth data sets. Um, and so once we've added a new use case, we'll need to update that truth data set to include the new output so that future tests do not have these same differences that are flagged. It will contain the new output and, um, and report no differences in that, in that case. Um, and that is all I have for today. Are there any questions? Thanks, George. Um, I don't see any new questions in the chat. Is there anybody with their hand up who wants to just shout? <laughs> oh, John, John Halley Galloway. Hey, hand. George, you know, if, if users follow the steps that John Opat's outlined to add a new use case, will that automatically get included in these automated tests? Um, yes, the instructions have um, have steps to add uh, information to the appropriate files to include the new use cases in the automated tests. Anyone else with their hand up? Or if not, then we will move on. So thanks again, George, and thank you. Move on to Tara, who's going to talk about existing examples of external contributions. Yes, um, we've actually kind of covered some of this, uh, but I, I did want to point out um, a, a few things that um, haven't been covered. One of them is um, for compilation, we do have community contribution to try and make the compilation uh, a little bit easier. So if you were to go to the download page, 
you'd come in, you'd see download, you'd see um, all of the recommended, um, you know, uh, links to the, um, the uh, packages and, and so forth. You scroll further down, you'll see um, a description of the software and you'll see, um, you know, the, the four steps for installation um, that are, you know, that we um, support and, and are recommended. And we had, uh, we had one contribution from Will Hathaway, um, who created a, a set of scripts, a bash script to do the self-installation. Um, and and uh, originally it was for some of the wharf um, capability, but then he added in um, scripts to install Met and, um, and then you know, the Met Plus wrappers around it. Um, those scripts are available on his GitHub page and they're supported by him. He is here on, at the, um, the workshop. Um, and I just wanted to, to call out um, that this is a, a really great example of, of how, you know, the community can help each other. So if you um, go ahead and, and check that out, if you have any questions, you can, um, you know, contact him directly and or um, let us know that you're having problems and we'll um, hook you up with Will as far as that goes. So that's one um, contribution. John HG already talked about the, um, the contribution from the Met Office, um, which is the first direct contribution to um, the Met C++ code base. Um, I shamelessly stole the, the um, end results here from um, Marian Mittermeier's uh, talk, um, showing that the initial work that was done by math um, I uh, gave a 50% speed up. Um, we are going to be working on trying to um, bring that into all of the other tools, especially the ones that are much more memory and computationally intensive. Um, I just wanted to call that out. And once again, here's the link to the issue. I'm just kind of showing how an issue is tied to um, direct contribution and development. Um, and then um, we've had a lot of community contributions in the area of S2S or sub-seasonal to seasonal. Um, uh, there are um, contributions coming in from NOAA from PSL. Um, and I just have one example here. I'm going to actually drop out of the presentation mode for just a second and show you if you follow the links um, in, in the slide deck, uh, what you would wind up doing is you'd wind up coming to um, the Met Plus user's guide. And, um, and this shows you uh, the documentation that you would see with regards to a use case. Um, in this case, we call it a, um, a the use case has um, a definition of user script. And that's because there's an, there's a, an additional layer of um, uh, scripting, um, Python scripting to drive um, the, the full computation of um, making the OMI plot, um, outgoing uh, long wave radiation, um, and Julian Oscillation Index. I think that's what OMI is. Um, and uh, so, so it, it's pieced together from um, using aspects of the MET tools, using aspects of MET plot or MET calc pi, and then aspects of MET plot pi. And um, because it doesn't really fit within a um, the current um, confines of the MET plus wrappers then we're demonstrating how you can um, use your own additional um, scripting to um, fit within the MET plus wrappers and to, to compute these um, types of diagnostics. Uh, so that is um, uh, one of the examples of some of the S2S contributions that are documented in the, in the MET plus user's guide. Um, there's also examples for um, the phase diagram, um, which is uh, looking at space-time coherence and, and um, you know, how, how um, quickly the, all the different um, planetary waves are, are, um, um, are propagating. Um, and then a standard S2S um, metric, which is the RMM um, and the plots associated with that for MJO. Um, for um, contributions from University of Illinois Champaign, or Urbana-Champaign, um, we have examples of um, co computing blocking um, in, in the indices and, and um, looking at the weather regimes and, and so forth. So similarly, there are um, use cases that demonstrate this, um, as well as uh, um, trying to um, then compute um, statistics from those indices. 
Um, and then if you want to see all of the contributions that have been um, provided to us so far in, in MetCalPy and MetPlotPy repositories, um, once again, here are a list of what's in MetCalPy, um, once again, the blocking weather and weather regime, um, RMM, OMI, space-time coherence, um, phase diagrams, and some other tropical diagnostics and, and so forth. Um, once again, going back to uh, the website, um, going back to if you were to follow those links, um, this is what the um, MetCalcPy GitHub repository looks like. Um, where um, if you go into the contributed code section, you would see that there are um, specific folders um, in there with the, the Python um, you know, scripts that, that were contributed. Um, and uh, similarly, here's MetPlotPy um, with contributed um, plotting and, and so forth. And once again, if you were to, to go into, say, like the space-time plot, you'll see the, the Python um, and then the YAML um, the, uh, configuration that wraps around that. So that's all I have for right now. I'm talking about you know current contributed code. Um, just wanted to give you some examples. So uh, any questions on on um, that part of it? Yes, we'll go officially go back to the questions slide. Thanks, Tara. Um, I don't again. I don't see any new ones in the um, comments for you that. There is one there for George, you know, so in case you didn't see George. Um, so if anyone has their hand up, um, maybe just speak up. Yeah, I mean, if, if there were hands up, you if you floated um, all the way up to the top, the, the hands would be um, at the top. Of the, the oh, OK. So, so I don't see anything like that. <laughs> George, do you want to take this question? Yeah. Uh, was responsible for conducting regression tests before merging changes into the main branch? Is there a gatekeeper? So, um, uh, George, if, if you have an answer, please come off mute. But I, until then, I, I could mention it. Um, so this is all described in our the Met Plus workflow. Um, there are GitHub workflow that's in the documentation for Met Plus. Um, basically, we use a develop branch to um, work towards the next official release. And so when you're adding a new feature, the new feature would be merged into the pull request would merge changes into the develop branch. Um, once we create a release, like for or the latest Met Plus release was version 4.1. So if you look in the MetPlus repository, you'll see a main underscore 4.1 branch. And so that's basically where we house, where we, where we provide support for that released version. So if there's a bug that's found, we'll fix that bug both in the main v4.1 branch, and we'll also fix it, which, which will basically prepare us for doing a bug fix release for that supported version. And we'll also fix it in the develop branch which will, you know, include the bug fix in the um, in the next official release. So, um, as far as who who conducts the regression testing, that's what's so fantastic about using GitHub Actions is that we're actually we we use um, you know re resources at at GitHub to uh, with with uh, software containers to run all the tests and and report those little check marks and X's. Um, so when a user is, or when we're adding a new use case, the developer of that use case, it's their responsibility to make sure that the, uh, their new use case runs uh, and produces a scientific result that it's intended to, to produce. Um, but then once you incorporate, uh, work with the MetPlus team to incorporate that into the set of use, use cases, then for every feature pull request, that use case is gonna get executed and we're gonna make sure it doesn't get broken. So that's the huge advantage to adding a use case to Met Plus is that we'll, you know, our automation, our, our testing automation and regression testing will make sure that we don't accidentally break it in the future. George, is there anything else you want to mention about that? I, I actually don't see him on. He might have had to have stepped off to go to another meeting. So thank you for that answer, John. 
Um, Eric, anything else that we need to do for this session? Um, I don't believe so. Uh, it says okay. that we have a break now, so. Yeah, so before we go to the break, um, being this is the first time we're going into um, parallel sessions, I just wanted to, um, you know, highlight um, and come back to um, the fact that we're going to have one of our um, parallel sessions. It should be um, at the same link. Um, I, that link has been updated since I sent out the PDF. So if you want to, um, you know, hear about um, some of the unique uses of NetPlus for data sets and, and so forth, um, come back to this um, Google session. Um, at 2 p.m. Uh, Mountain Time, uh, 4 p.m. Eastern Time, um, and that what that would be is what um, uh, 20 um, 21 p.m. 2100 UTC. I have to do the conversion. Um, and then, um, if you are interested in in hearing how Metplus is being used for S2S um, verification and diagnostics. That would be session five, um, and you would instead go to um, a different link, um, KDK, uh, KDK um, and, and so forth. Um, I will put um, both, I, I'll put those in the chat right as, as the session is starting. But if you're interested in S2S, you need to go to the, the, um, the separate um, Google Meet session. Um, any questions on that? Okay, and then as that session ends, that will be the end of the day. We will not come back into plenary here. Um, so as your session completes, feel free to, um, you know, uh, say thank you to your chairs and your, and your presenters, and we will see everyone tomorrow morning, at least um, Colorado time at 8.30 a.m., um, similar to the start time of today. And um, being we are just breaking out um, and, and going into these parallel sessions, I, I want to say thank you to all of our um, session chairs as well as all of the presenters for today. I think so far it's been a really interesting um, uh, workshop and, and I, we look forward to hearing what people have to say in the next session and, and um, diving back in tomorrow. So with that, uh, take a half an hour break and then come back and, and hear how other people are using the plus. Thanks. <laughs>